Hey folks, uh, Mr. Howard here, going to read uh, chapter 16 of The Picture of Dorian Gray uh, with analysis for you. Last time we read chapter 15. Uh, in chapter 14, uh, Dorian blackmailed Alan Campbell into destroying Basil's body. In chapter 15 that night, he went to a party at Lady Narborough's house where he became horribly uneasy and upset and decided to go home. He burned Basil's things and then he... Um, you know, stared at the substance that was in a drawer in a, a chest or something in his room, um, which looked either as opium or poison, like he was thinking about killing himself or, or trying to escape somehow. Um, ultimately, instead of doing whatever it is, he leaves his house, um, pays essentially a taxi cab, they're called Handsome's, a coach, uh, to take him to the East End. We don't know what he's going to do in the East End, uh, but that's how that chapter ended. And it brings us to chapter 16. Uh, in which Dorian is going to go into the East End and visit an opium den. This is a great chapter on a number of levels. Uh, first off, it, it really sort of ties in that um, gothic, mysterious theme in a way that it didn't before. Uh, secondly, we're going to see that double life that Dorian's been living. We've heard all kinds of hints that he goes to horrible places and, and comes back, but we haven't actually visited it any of those places with him. In fact, everything we've seen from Dorian is very much, um, you know, him being sort of in that elite, in that upper element of society. And so um, we're going to, we're going to see the, the seedy underbelly of London. I think, you know, if you're looking at Dorian as a symbol or a representation of Victorian English society, this is an important chapter. The idea that he, he's beautiful and seems innocent and leads this perfect, high-class, high-quality life all the time is very much the image that uh, British society wanted to put out, that everybody wanted the people to think the Victorian age was all about. But there was also this really seedy, slummy underbelly of Victorian life, and that comes across um, in this chapter. And so we sort of get a, a depth a deepening, we'll go with deepening, of um, that allegory or that metaphor throughout. So I'm, I'm not going to talk anymore. Let's, let's just read the chapter and I'll give you uh, whatever insights I can as I read it. Chapter 16. A cold rain began to fall and the blurred street lamps looked ghastly in the dripping mist. The public houses were just closing and dim men and women were clustering in broken groups round their doors. From some of the bars came the sound of horrible laughter, and others drunkards brawled and screamed. Laying back in his hansom, with his hat pulled over his forehead, Dorian Gray watched with listless eyes the sordid shame of the great city, and now and then he repeated to himself the words that Lord Henry said to him on the first day they had met, to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul. Yes, that was a secret. He had often tried it and would try it again now. There were opium dens where one could buy oblivion. Dens of horror where the memory of old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. Oh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, you know, we've got, we got a lot of, of tone words that show up. Uh, in the very first line, it's ghastly. Then we have horrible laughter. We have screaming. Um, we get these sort of gothic tone words going on. It's a dark, disturbing scene that we're going through here. Also, the sordid shame of the great city. That ties into this idea of Dorian's double life or maybe Victorian England's double life. Uh, you know, we're going to see that seedy, sordid underbelly in this chapter. Um, then we've got that, that quote from Lord Henry, to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul, which is, um, you've got the word horror following that, and then the idea of uh, old sins could be destroyed by the madness of sins that were new. So to get rid of old sins, commit new, new sins. Very Lord Henry, um, very sort of hedonism, um, you know, going on here. But he's he's trying to retreat into the five senses, into the physical uh, he's leaving sort of the soul behind. The moon hung low in the sky like a yellow skull. From time to time, a huge misshapen cloud stretched a long arm across and hit it. We got um, a simile and a personification also setting the tone. The gas lamps grew fewer and the streets narrow and gloomy. Once, the man lost his way and had to drive back half a mile. Steam rose from the horse as it splashed in the puddles. The side windows of the handsome were clogged with gray flannel mist. Uh, we get this mysterious tone with the mist. It's very, um, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, sort of a labyrinth image of London with people getting lost and trying to find their way. 
to cure the soul by means of the senses and the senses by means of the soul. How the words rang in his ears. His soul certainly was sick to death. Was it true that the senses could cure it? Innocent blood had been spilled. What could atone for that? Ah, for that there was no atonement. But though forgiveness was impossible, forgetfulness was possible still. And he was determined to forget, to stamp the thing out, to crush it as one would crush an adder. There's a snake metaphor, or, you know, simile, I guess, as. Uh, so, you know, connections to the biblical Genesis story, which have been going on throughout here as well. Indeed, what right had Basil to have spoken to him as he had done? Who made him a judge over others? He had said things that were dreadful, horrible, not to be endured. On and on plotted the handsome, going slower, it seemed to him at each step. He thrust up the trap and called to the man to drive faster. The hideous hunger for opium began to gnaw at him. His throat burned and his delicate hands twitched nervously together. He struck at the horse madly with his stick. The driver laughed and whipped up. He laughed in answer, and the man was silent. The way seemed interminable in the streets, like the black web of some sprawling spider. Another great simile there, both the labyrinth and the trap. Um, sort of an evil aura. The monotony became unbearable, and as the mist thickened, he felt afraid. Then they passed by the lonely brick fields. The fog was lighter here, and he could see strange bottle-shaped kilns with their orange fan-like tongues of fire. A dog barked as they went by, and far away in the darkness, some wandering seagull screamed. The horse stumbled in a rut, then swerved aside and broke into a gallop. Uh, these are all hell images. I think that's pretty clear. you got these brick kilns. Now, first off, London's a city made of brick in the Victorian age, and making bricks was really, really cheap work, but it, you know, fed people who were starving. And so lots of people made bricks on the, on the borders of the city, and so he's driving through the brick fields where all these kilns are making bricks, even in the middle of the night, um, and it produces this lurid red flame. Then we have a dog bark. Is that Cerberus? Is that like the gate to hell sort of thing? I think so. Um, then we have the screaming seagull. I mean, like, we're getting closer and closer to a more disturbing um, location, and Oscar Wilde's doing everything he can to make this sort of religious and, and interesting. Um, after some time, they left the clay road and rattled again over the rough paven streets. Most of the windows were dark, but now and then fantastic shadows were silhouetted against some lamplit blind. He watched them curiously. They moved like monstrous marionettes. Are those demons? Is the hell imagery deepening? And made gestures like living things. He hated them. A, a dull rage was in his heart. As they turned a corner, a woman yelled something at them from an open window, and two men ran after the handsome for about a hundred yards. The driver beat at them with his whip. It is said that passion makes one think in a circle. Certainly, with hideous iteration, the bitten lips of Dorian Gray shaped and reshaped those subtle words that dealt with soul and sense, till he found them in them the full expression, as it were, of his mood, and justified by intellectual approval, passions that without such justification would still have dominated his temper. From cell to cell of his brain crept one thought, and the wild desire to live, the most terrible of all men's appetites, quickened into force each trembling nerve and fiber. Ugliness, that had once been hateful to him because it made things real, became dear to him now for that very reason. Ugliness was the one reality. That's an interesting phrase because it's connected to this theme about realism versus romanticism. Um, you know, it, it relates to the artistry versus the, the reality of his life. Um, you know, the senses are grounded in reality, but he is very interested in art. The, so, the secret to escaping morality so far has been to think of his life as a play and to become a spectator of that play. But I guess one of the secrets, too, is to just indulge yourself completely in living life and not consider any aspect of it. So it's almost like there's two escapes and they're contradictory to each other, and yet he's able to sort of double-think himself into, into believing both of them simultaneously. Um, let's see. The coarse brawl, the loathsome den, the crude violence of disordered life, the very vileness of thief and outcast were more vivid in their intense actuality of impression than all the gracious shapes of art, the dreamy shadows of song. They were what he needed for forgiveness, forgetfulness. In three days, he would be free. So he's going to go on a three-day opium binge. Three days, of course, is a biblical number. You know, when you look at um, Jesus and his resurrection, so... Uh, as opposed to sitting in a tomb for three days dead, he's going to lay dead to the world in an opium, you know, overdose for three days and then come back and be fine. 
Suddenly, the man drew up with a jerk at the top of a dark lane. Over the low roofs and jagged chimney stacks of the houses rose the black masts of ships. Wreaths of white mist clung like ghostly sails to the yard. More gothic imagery. Um, but we're in the east end. We're, we're there with the ships on the, on the bay. Or the river. Somewhere about. Somewhere about here, yeah, ain't it, sir? He asked huskily through the trap. Dorian stared and peered around. This will do he answered, and having got out hastily and given the driver the extra fare he had promised him, he walked quickly in the direction of the quay. Here and there a lantern gleamed at the stern of some huge merchantman. The light shook and splintered into the puddles. A red glare came from an outward-bound steamer that was coaling. The slimy pavement looked like a wet Macintosh. He hurried on toward the left, glancing back now and then to see if he was being followed. In about seven or eight minutes, he reached a small, shabby house that was wedged in between two gaunt factories. In one of the top windows stood a lamp. He stopped and gave a peculiar knock. After a little time, he heard steps in the passage and, when, and the chain being unhooked. The door opened quietly, and he went in without saying a word to the squat, misshapen figure that flattened itself into the shadow as he passed. At the end of the hall hung a tattered green curtain that swayed and shook in the gusty wind, which had followed him in from the street. He dragged it aside and entered a long, low room, which looked as if it had once been a third-rate dancing saloon. Shrill, flaring gas jets, dulled and distorted in the fly-blown mirrors that faced them, were ranged around the walls. Greasy reflectors of ribbed tin backed them, making quivering disks of light. The floor was covered with ochre-colored sawdust trampled here and there into mud and stained with dark rings of spilt liquor. Some malays were crouching by a little charcoal stove, playing with bone counters and showing their white teeth as they chattered. Uh, you might argue that this is sort of a racist portrayal of Malaysians, and I would agree with that. Uh, but, you know, like the... the this is a bad part of town. This is where all the poor folks are. It's next to the docks. You know, Oscar Wilde is trying to set a mood in a Victorian way. In one corner, with his head buried in his arms, a sailor sprawled over a table. And by the tawdrily painted bar that ran across one complete side stood two haggard women, mocking an old man who was brushing the sleeves of his coat with an expression of disgust. He thinks he's got red ants on him, huh? laughed one of them as Dorian passed by. The man looked at her in terror and began to whimper. Now, obviously, this guy's, like, been drugged up a little too much and is having some sort of a, a vision. Um, but it's a vision of torture. So is this another Satan hell image? At the end of the room, there was a little staircase leading to a darkened chamber. As Dorian hurried up its three rickety steps, the heavy door of the opium... Sorry, the heavy odor of opium met him. He heaved a deep breath, and his nostrils quivered with pleasure. When he entered, a young man with smooth yellow hair, who was bending over a lamp, lighting a long, thin pipe, looked up at him and nodded in a hesitating manner. You here, Adrian? muttered Dorian. Pause. Hey, Adrian, we've heard that name before. Uh, he was one of the people that Dorian knew that Basil accused him of ruining his life. His name was Adrian Singleton. We also saw that name again the chapter later when Dorian was reading a book to distract himself from thinking about Basil. The book had been given to him by Adrian Singleton. So this is that guy, a rich young kid that Dorian has corrupted. And where is he? He's in this horrible opium den that has been equated to hell. That's significant. Let's see. You hear Adrian, muttered Dorian. Where else should I be? He answered listlessly, none of the chaps will speak to me now. I thought you'd left England. Darlington's not going to do anything. My brother paid the bill at last. George doesn't speak to me either. I don't care, he added with a sigh. As long as one has this stuff, one doesn't want friends. I think I've had too many friends. Dorian winced and looked round at the grotesque things that lay in such fantastic postures on the ragged mattresses. Pause again. If you haven't seen what opium dens look like, go look up some pictures of Victorian-era opium dens. These people smoke, like, hookah lamps, and then they... they Opium is an opiate, you know, like, where, where the word opiate comes from. These people fall into sort of dazes and stupors and lie in all kinds of weird contorted postures with glazed expressions. This is a pretty good description of what it looks like. The twisted limbs, the gaping mouths, the staring lusterless eyes fascinated him. He knew in what strange heavens they were suffering and what dull hells were teaching them the secret of some new joy. This is the paradox of opium. It's both heavenly and hellish. Uh, and Oscar Wilde is trying to get that drug addiction idea across. They were better off than he was. He was prisoned in thought. 
memory, like a horrible malady was eating his soul 